All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started with um, our guest speaker tonight. My name is Tarsha Stanley, and I am the Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Sciences here at St. Catherine University. And this is the Summer Integrated Learning Series. Integrated Learning at St. Catherine University is a multidimensional expression of an active liberal arts pedagogy. Located at the intersection of creative energy and critical reflection, the Integrated Learning Series is one way we partner academics with activism, the paper with the performance, and the campus with the community. It is the array of courses, activities, speakers, events, performances, and exhibitions that coalesce into our ways of knowing. The Integrated Learning Series is the web that binds our learning experiences together and the narratives that connect our collective community. Our theme for the Summer Integrated Learning Series is at the confluence of the liberal arts and social justice, race in the machine. Please join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Dr. Rachel Nywert from the History Department. Dr. Nywert is going to give a presentation about 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we will take questions in the chat. So welcome to you, Dr. Nywert. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here, and thank you to all of you for joining us on this sunny evening. Um, it's such a pleasure to get to share the work, even from a distance with all of you. So I'm just going to, um, you know, try to push the right buttons here so that I can share my screen and then we'll get started. Let's see. Um, there we go. So I assume now you can all see my PowerPoint. Maybe if just one person could say yeah. yes, because I can't yeah, see right. you anymore. Okay, yeah. great. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm really excited to share um, this project that I've been working on um, with you all this evening, though it's not just my project. Um, I'm part of an interdisciplinary team at St. Kate's that's working on this work, and we'll talk more about that as the night goes on. Um, to give you a sense of where we're headed this evening, um, I'm going to start by just saying a little bit about me and why this work. I'll introduce. Um, the project Mapping Prejudice, and then our St. Kate's collaboration, Welcoming the Dear Neighbor with the question mark. The question mark is a really important piece, so we don't want to lose that from the title. I'll talk a little bit about why these projects are significant, a little bit about what we've learned, so what, why it matters, and then what um, you can do to get involved. So that's kind of where we're headed um, for this evening. But I do think this why me piece is sort of an important place to start. Um, so, you know, I am, you know, a white middle class woman who I live, I'm sitting in my basement in my family room. Um, this is the second house that my husband and I have purchased. Um, I grew up in a house that my parents um, had bought and my grandparents both bought their own homes about, I don't know, five years or so after they immigrated to the United States from Europe after the Second World War. Um, so, you know, my life experience of housing is that lots of people work really hard to make it possible for you to live in a house, um, right? My sort of family history has made it seem possible and within reach. Realtors have helped, you know, my husband and I to find homes. Um, you know, lenders have helped us to be able to afford homes. Um, it's always been a yes. It's never been a no. Um, and so my experience or my relationship with this work certainly doesn't come from my own experience. And I think it's important to say that first because I'm learning still and I'm learning a lot. But I think a good place to start the learning is to recognize that my experience isn't the same as everybody else's. And that it's important to think about that and recognize that and care about it. Um, the other piece of the why me is, you know, technically in my graduate program, um, you know, if you look at my CV, it says that my PhD is in modern British history, which is true. That's what I do. I study children and education um, in the British Empire. 
And I really love that work. It's really interesting to me. Um, this project, though, that I'm going to talk about, you know, it's about housing inequality in Ramsey County, has utterly nothing to do with Britain um, or children or the British Empire. Um, none of those things come into this research. This is a completely new area of research for me. And sometimes I feel, you know, when I'm doing this work, I feel sort of vaguely uncomfortable because I feel like in the academy, you know, what we're taught is you get this PhD and it sort of sets you back and, you know, you have your little corner of space that you occupy. And you're not ever supposed to leave that corner, right? Your corner is your corner then forever. But what I realized in my years here at St. Kate's is that I'm a great British historian, um, but I'm not sure that's what my students need me to be. Um, I think it's fine if I'm that for them. But what I realized was that I was watching students in other departments have such robust experiences of participating in research. And I couldn't provide that to my students because I can't take them to archives. Um, in Britain, right? That's the really fun part of historical research is getting to sit in the archives and touch the stuff, right? It's the really part two sometimes, but it's really cool. And there wasn't a way for me to involve students in that work. And I think if I want to be the professor that my students at St. Kate's need me to be, I needed to find ways that I could engage them in research. And so I'm so excited <laughs> that this interdisciplinary group at St. Kate's and that the people working at Mapping Prejudice were willing to welcome me, a British historian, into their corner of the academy to help do this work. But again, it also means I am still learning. <laughs> um, this is new for me. And so I'm still building my picture um, of what this story of housing inequality in the 20th century in the United States and Ramsey County more particularly looks like. All right, so that's a little bit about me and my work and sort of why I do this work. But here's what I'm working on. Um, so our St. Kate's Welcoming the Dear Neighbor Project comes out of a research collaboration with the Mapping Prejudice Project, which is housed at the U of M. And the Mapping Prejudice Project is this utterly amazing historical project amazing in a number of different ways. Um, so it builds on work in urban history um, that tries to answer the question of what changes between the 19th and the 20th century in terms of housing and in terms of where people live. Because one of the things that's roughly true in the 19th century is that cities are much more um, integrated. Um, and by the time you head into the 20th century, cities are much more segregated. Now, before we get like really excited about the 19th century and how cities are integrated, like we should temper that because like plantations in the 19th century are integrated spaces too. And that doesn't say anything about the nature of equality, right? Um, so integration shouldn't be the only standard, but it does seem to be the case that something changes between the 19th and the 20th century. And the Mapping Prejudice Projects helps us to think about what changes and why does it change. And so what Mapping Prejudice is interested in identifying, and they have completed this work in Hennepin County, and they are almost done in Ramsey County. They're interested in tracking the presence of racial covenants um, in our cities. A racial covenant was simply language that was added to a housing deed that said um, that people who weren't white couldn't live there. And so I have two examples up on the screen. Um, the first that's typed comes 1916. This is an example of a racial covenant on um, a property in Hennepin County. Um, in South Minneapolis. And this language here is pretty common actually in a lot of um, housing covenants in Hennepin County. So the party of the second part hereby agrees, right? That's just talking about the deed and right who's named in the deed. Hereby agrees that the premises hereby made shall not at any time be conveyed, mortgaged or leased to any person or persons of Chinese, Japanese, Moorish, Turkish, Negro, Mongolian, or African blood or descent, 
right? So here it spells out a whole list of people and says none of these folks can live in this house. And the thing that was so powerful about racial covenants is that it didn't just mean in 1916 when this deed was issued. This racial covenant travels with the property. So there was not a way to make this go away, right? If in 1918, the people who owned this piece of property sold it and the next people who moved in thought, well, I don't like that, I don't wanna have that, they couldn't get rid of it. The only way they could have gotten rid of it is go by going back to the original property owners and saying, would you agree to get rid of this? So they're very tricky things to break. Um, you have here the little um, sort of image that comes below gives another example of what they look like. This is actually an image from an actual deed. So here point E says no persons of any race other than the Aryan race shall use or occupy any building or any lot, except that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race, domiciled with an owner or a tenant. And I, you know, point F is included here just as a note, F has nothing to do with the racial covenant. Um, you know, look at how it's listed. None of these people can live here. And then on the next line, um, no trailer, basement, tent, shack, garage, barn, right? Um, it's such a shocking and startling way, I think, to list the information. And this is how it looks in deeds, right? These people can't live here. Also, you can't have a garage too close to the street. Um, it's so shocking and so awful. Um, so historians have long known that racial covenants have existed. That's not news. Um, what Mapping Prejudice has figured out is a method by which to have a holistic picture of where they existed. So in Hennepin County, housing deeds were digitized. Mapping Prejudice um, was able to take those digitized deeds and load them into a computer program that I can't explain at all. Um, that does, um, it has optical character recognition capacities. And what it did is it surveyed all these deeds and flagged deeds that had potential racial language in them. But then somebody has to go through and see what's actually flagged, right? Because potential racial language includes the word white, okay? But right, you could be Betty White who bought a house. You could be buying a house in White Bear Lake. And all of those things are gonna get flagged, but they're not a problem, right? That's not racial language. That's just somebody's name. That's just the name of a town. So what Mapping Prejudice does then is they have an online platform where um, people, anybody, can come online and help them to search the deeds that get flagged to identify the ones that actually have a racial covenant. Now, if this was a different night, I would have now taken you all to the Mapping Prejudice website and taught you how to do the searching. Um, but Mapping Press um, is having, I suppose, a good problem to have. Um, we expected that when the work with Ramsey County started that it would take about three years because that's about what it took to do Hennepin County. And on a good day in the three years that um, people could work on Hennepin County, about 150 deeds would get searched a day. Um, in the weeks since George Floyd was murdered because of the attention that's been brought to the Mapping Prejudice Project because of the really incredible work that they're doing, um, we've had, there have been days where 4,000 deeds are getting searched. Um, so I'm not going to take you to have you search a deed tonight. I'm very sorry. You just have to listen to me. I'll provide you some opportunities where you can maybe um, look at that later. But what this then ends up allowing is a way for everyone um, to get to see where these um, racial covenants are in a holistic fashion. And we're going to leave my PowerPoint for just a minute. We'll see how adept I am at switching. And I'm going to go to their website just for a second so you can see what a finished map would look like. So this is one of the map versions that you can see of Hennepin County. And anywhere you see the red, that gives you, that's a place or a lot where there's a racial covenant. And you can come down here to the search button and we can type in an address. I'm gonna put in um, the address of the first house 
that my husband and I bought when we moved here to the Twin Cities in 2004. So that little um, flag there, that's our house. Um, not currently, but it was our first house. Um, it does not have a racial covenant, but you can see just up the road from where we lived, it's blanketed in racial covenants. So we lived in Northeast Minneapolis, not far from St. Anthony Village. And if I were to keep moving the screen, here we are now in St. Anthony Village proper, like the whole town, this whole community is covered in racial covenants. So if you live in Hennepin County, I would encourage you to come and search the map um, and see what you can learn. Um, let's, we're gonna go back to my PowerPoint though. All right, so here we are. So you get a way to see what the map looks like and see sort of across the city where these look um, or where these racial covenants are. And it turns out that's really crucial work, okay? And this speaks to the significance. Because what does mapping prejudice offer that's new? Again, it's not that racial covenants exist. People knew they existed. Um, it provides this holistic picture. And I think it also provides a really clear illustration of systemic racism. Because if you think about all that red on that map, that red isn't there because single individuals said, I don't want a black person to live in my house. It's a lot of red, like something bigger is happening. Okay, It's a way to see systemic racism. Um, now, what does our project contribute? Welcoming the dear neighbor. Um, so our project is welcoming the dear neighbor with a question mark. Um, again, the question mark is key because we wanna query and sort of ask the question here in Ramsey County, did we welcome the dear neighbor or did we not? Um, I don't think it will shock you all to know that in fact, we were not great welcomers of the dear neighbor in Ramsey County on a number of different fronts. Um, but I think it's an important question to ask. Um, Professor Tyann Coleman um, in the English department, I think has given the best description of what the Welcoming the Dear Neighbor Project um, contributes in her comment that it humanizes the map. It takes the map with all this red across it and it helps to illuminate the stories that exist behind all those red spices. It helps to tell us the stories of the people who were excluded from living where they wanted to live it helps to tell us the stories of the people who did the excluding, right? And those stories are key because in Minnesota, right? We talked about this last week when um, Nancy was speaking, right? This idea of Minnesota nice lets us think about or lets us imagine or create space at least where we can imagine that we weren't racist, that racism wasn't a problem here. And that's not true. And I think particularly the folks who need to hear that um, are right, white people in Minnesota um, who like to imagine that racism exists somewhere else, but not here. Okay? So our project is working to humanize the map, to tell some of these stories, um, to make more clear some of the context. I think the other way we can think about it is that our project is working to explain how. How does the map come to be covered in red? Okay, so here you have an advertisement. Um, just so you know, racial covenants weren't like a secret thing. Um, this is an advertisement from the St. Paul Daily News in August of 1913. It's about um, a sort of set of lots in Como Park, right? It notes this is a great place to live. And in that little box that says, remember, I know it's a little hard to see, there's sort of nine reasons why this is an awesome place to um, buy a lot and build a house, right? And so, you know, lots of good things. The midway is the growing way. Uh, you get to live near Como Park. It only costs one fare to get to either city. And then there in point number seven, what it says is colored people excluded. Right, this is meant to tell us that this was an addition that was completely covered in racial covenants. And it was a selling feature, right? Not a secret, a selling feature, okay? 
All right, so challenges with still learning. So what are we learning in terms of my part of this project? So what I've been working on is um, better understanding some of the historical context of housing segregation and housing inequality um, in Ramsey County in particular. Um, and there's not a lot of historical work that focuses on St. Paul. So I don't even really know like who are the people um, and what are the events. So what I was interested in doing is working through newspapers to get a sense of a chronology and sort of in a, a timeline of events and people that were engaged in conversations about housing um, in Ramsey County in the 20th century. Now, the work has been definitely made more challenging by COVID because historians work with primary sources, which are usually found in archives. All of the archives closed in March. Um, I am anticipating that they might not open again until 2021. So I'm currently limited to sources that are available in electronic format, <laughs> um, which is in a ton. But I'm doing my best with what I have. It does mean, though, that the couple of stories here that I'm going to share with you are incomplete. What I know about them is incomplete because I only access what I can access digitally and it's not the whole story. So as I said, I've been working in newspapers. So this is actually not a Minnesota newspaper. This is a page from the New York Age, which was a African-American newspaper published out of New York. This particular article came from May 27th, 1909. And I'm just gonna read it quick because I'm not sure how big it looks on your screen. So it might be hard to see. Um, St. Paul, Minnesota, May 25th. The Anglo-Saxon aristocracy upon Crocus Hill have been much exercised over the fact that two Negro families have moved upon Lincoln Avenue. The owner, Dr. H.P. Bell, a dentist, has been sent threatening letters to remove his tenants. The white neighbors, who are all very wealthy people, met on May 20th and appointed a committee to hold a consultation with the owner and his agent, Lawyer J.P. Anderson, colored, who's credited with having put Negro tenants into the flats. The tenants have had to call in the protection of the police as rocks have been thrown into the windows. The rest of the column moves on to just other stories about the African-American community in St. Paul. Um, so that's why we only have this first paragraph. So I wanna share just a couple of things that I notice when I look at this story. So first of all, where does this story appear? So this is a New York newspaper, but I'm 100% sure they are taking this story from somewhere else. If I had to guess, I think they're taking it from one of the St. Paul daily newspapers. I don't know for sure because the St. Paul Daily newspapers aren't digitized, so I can't see them, um, but that would be my guess. I can tell you where they're not taking it from. There's a pretty vibrant African-American press in St. Paul in the 20th century and you know, also in Minneapolis. Those papers are digitized. They're not taking the story from there. And you know, here's why I think. I think that's because I don't think it's news in the African-American community in St. Paul in May of 1909 that white neighbors don't want black neighbors. It's not news. And so they don't write about it, um, which by itself as a fact is startling, right? Um, and a terrible thing, um, but yet true. The date here I think is also interesting. May 27th of 1909. So the first racial covenant that Mapping Prejudice has found um, dates back to 1910. So this is before racial covenants, probably, right here in the Twin Cities. But what they've come up with is a sort of ad hoc way to deal with new neighbors, right? Um, and yet, you know, I wonder if the relationship here isn't that right once we start to have neighborhoods that are becoming more and more integrated, that then white folks think they need a way um, to make their neighborhoods more exclusive. I think the note here about the lawyer, J.P. Anderson, is an interesting one. So one thing that's interesting to know that I have only recently learned about this story um, because of some work that I've been doing with two really great students um, this summer, the owner of these properties, Dr. H.P. Bell, 
is himself an African-American man, but he does not get recognized as that in this article. Only the lawyer here does, and the, um, the two families who move in. Um, I think this is because it's not a problem that Bell owns the properties. It's a problem that someone tried to move black families in. So the lawyer, J.P. Anderson, becomes the problem. Now, he also works for the Postal Service, and I know that the, um, these white families that live on Crocus Hill actually send a letter to the Postal Service to try to get him fired. So these white neighbors, they meet on May 20th. Um, in a later story in the New York Age, they'll describe this meeting as an indignation meeting. Okay? Um, again, it's sort of an ad hoc gathering. And our article here concludes by saying that the tenants have had to call in the protection of the police. Though I do wonder what that means. When the police came, what did they do? Because I know historically that when police were called to protect the homes of black families, frequently they did not. They protected the white people who were trying to break windows, who were trying um, to hurt right, the families who had moved in. But we don't know. This is all I have as sort of a starting piece. But the story of what things look like doesn't end here. I promise I'm almost done. I'll go fast so that there's still lots of time for questions. But this story is a particularly important one, I think, for St. Kate's. Um, so this is another story from the St. Paul Dispatch. So this is a story that we found before the archives closed from November of 1924. So W.T. Francis, colored attorney, moved into the home purchased from George Olson at 2092 Sargent Avenue Friday night. Neighbors reported today. A fund was being raised whereby Francis was to be reimbursed for any expense he had incurred within the understanding that he would give up the place. A letter has been sent to residents of the district by Francis defending his position. So this, I think, is a critical story um, for a number of reasons. Um, and there are a number of interesting things happen, happening here. So I want to start with the address. I'm sorry, um, there's a typo here. So it is actually 2092 Sargent Avenue. So when I map quest this address, this address is an eight minute walk from St. Kate's. So we're not talking about somewhere else. We're talking about the neighborhood where we work, OK? Um, that's where this is. In a neighborhood where we work in 1924, when St. Kate's was there, white people tried to push William and Nellie Francis out of their house. And they didn't like do it once. They spent two years trying to push them out of their house. I think the location is key. I think it's interesting here that they only identify W.T. Francis as moving into the home because he moves into the home with his wife, Nellie Francis, who's pictured here. Nellie Francis and William, um, William Francis were really leaders in the African-American community in St. Paul in the early 20th century. Nellie Francis helps to um, write the anti-lynching legislation that's passed um, in Minnesota in the early 1920s. She's a leader in um, the African-American suffrage societies in the early part of the 20th century. But she gets written out of the story here, right? She doesn't show up. Okay. A fund was being raised, right? So here we have these neighbors again. There's not a racial covenant in this house, so they try to look for an ad hoc way to kick the Francis family out. And here we get this great thing that's so intriguing to me as a historian, right? A letter has been sent to residents of the district by Francis. Oh, I wish I could find that letter. Oh, it would be so much easier to find if the archives were open. Um, but it would be so interesting to see what he says. But I know where this story ends. This story ends an eight minute walk from St. Kate's with the white neighbors burning a cross in the front yard of the Francis home. You know, we're not talking about cross burning here in Mississippi or Alabama. We're talking about cross burning in the neighborhood where we all work. Um, and I have to be honest, before I started this research, Cross burning is not the thing I put in the neighborhood where I worked. Cross burning is what I put in Alabama. But it wasn't just in Alabama. It was here, right here. Okay. So why does this matter? I think it matters because 
if we want to understand the significant disparities um, in housing in the Twin Cities today, we have to understand this past. And this past has huge legacies in our present. Um, huge legacies. And so this is why I think it's important. I think too, I'll just note, because I, you know, I'm definitely a women's historian. The way that women get erased in this story is cute. All right, so what can you do? Join a detranscription session. You can go to the Mapping Prejudice website to see those. Watch Jim Crow the Nar North. Mapping Prejudice, all their data is freely available, so you can work on it. You can involve your class in Mapping Prejudice. Be sure to work with the um, Community Work and Learning Office to set that up. Um, and also vote, because there's important issues that help relate to this. And coming soon, they'll be a Welcoming the Dear Neighbor website. All right, I was long and I talked fast. Here's one moment so you can see all the folks involved and I'll be done now. <laughs>